I wasn't, I wasn't glad when I seen unto me <laughs> that snow starting to come down when I was on the freeway. <laughs> I'm like, you know what, devil? You know what I'm saying? He's the prince of the power of the air. He has, he has limited authority over the weather. We see that from the book of Job. My daughter called and said, I guess this is going to be another one of those days where you see people's cars all down there on the side. You're on the freeway, their cars all down there. It's, it, it face, facing the wrong way. How you turn that way? With the, wheel, with the tire still spinning. Then the next day, it's 70 outside. Your car tore up. For 15 minutes on the freeway, the devil is a liar. <laughs> Y'all love the Lord anyway. Wasn't it 70 like day before yesterday? You all outside with your t-shirt on and you, 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 you all just outside just, you know, hully gully. And, and, and then you go to bed and wake up the next day and it's zero outside and 20 inches of snow. That's Cleveland for you. But we're here anyway. Yeah, y'all got here before the snow. You better have your snow brush ready because your car got a whole bunch of snow. It was all these cars parked out in front with all this snow up on them. I said, see, when they came, out, came in, it was good. They're going to go outside and be like, what the heck happened? Say amen. One thing about this building, though, we be lightweight immune to what's going on outside. I remember one time we were in here doing something, and afterwards we went outside and I'm like, what happened? Did the bomb hit? <laughs> it was a bad storm. We didn't feel it. We didn't hear Amen. We're going to go in the book of Psalms. We're going to continue this new year uh, as we have decreed it to be the year of expectation. And I've been endeavoring to present a word that motivates and exhorts you to believe God along that vein, that vein of expectation. And once again, we're still fresh in this year. We're only three weeks in, I believe. This is the beginning of the fourth week, I think, uh, because January 1st was on a Sunday. And uh, I'm, I'm still more out there than I am up here. If you can balance it for me, I'd appreciate it. And, um, you know, a lot of people have forgotten their resolutions already. Short shelf life. Some folks, some folks stop smoking cigarettes for one day. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking about y'all. Y'all don't smoke cigarettes. I'm talking about the ones out there that do smoke cigarettes. And every New Year's resolution, they say they're going to stop smoking cigarettes. I remember I used to smoke when I was young. And we were like, if cigarettes ever get up to 45 cents a pack, I'm going to stop smoking. Y'all remember those days? Then they get the 45 cent. Well, they better not get the 50 cent. Because I'm not paying no 50 cent for no pack of cigarettes. I think a pack of cigarettes now is like $10. I wouldn't smoke if I wanted to smoke because I couldn't afford to smoke. Lucy's going for $2. <laughs> Somebody said, what is a Lucy? <laughs> I said, Lucy's going for $2. Somebody's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, how you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go in the book of Psalms. We'll be in the book of Now it sounds perfect. I'm perfect up here, Drew. S Psalm 102. And then we're going to be all right. Amen. Amen. Psalm 102. We're going to read. And then we're going to pop over in Isaiah and then go to Habakkuk. And, and we'll be all right. Psalm 102, verse 1. Actually, I'll read the heading. It says, A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and poureth out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me. In the day when I call, answer me speedily. Verse 8, mine enemies reproach me all the day. And they that are mad against me are sworn against me, for I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping because of thine indignation and thy wrath, for thou hast lifted me up and cast me down. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shall endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise 
and have mercy upon Zion for the time to favor her. Yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in their stones and favor the dust thereof. Isaiah, the 66th chapter. Isaiah, the 66th chapter. The fifth verse says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, but he shall appear to your joy, and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born in once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God? Final readings in the book of Habakkuk. And I think we've been there for the past week or so. Turn right in your Bible to Habakkuk. It's right before Zephaniah. Somebody said, well, gee, thanks for that. <laughs> where the heck is Zephaniah at? I know where Zechariah is, but his boy Zephaniah, where is he at? Habakkuk chapter 1. O Lord, how long shall I cry? Verse 2, and thou wilt not hear. Even cry unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not say. Was lest thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance with spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment does never go forth. For the wicked does compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. Chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Final reading, third chapter, verse 17 and 18, although the fig tree shall not blossom, Neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Father, bless us this morning, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The, in the 102nd Psalm, as well as in the 66th chapter of the book of Isaiah, we see utilized by their respective writers the name or the term Zion. Everyone say Zion. Zion is a term, Zion is a designation, an appellation. The Zion is a name that represents the people of God who are impacted and who are influenced by and who endeavor to walk in the plans and the purpose of God and seek to walk in the steps that they believe God has ordered for them to walk in. Say amen. amen. Talking about the majority of you in here on this morning. And in those instances of the reference to the name Zion, we see Zion, we see the people of God who are endeavoring to walk in the plans and the purpose and the will and the ways of God. We see them suffering, travailing, distressed, grieved, aggravated, irritated, undergoing a great deal of adversity. While at the same time we see them desiring deliverance, 
desiring rescue and relief from all of their many struggles and all of their many troubles and problems, issues that they are dealing with, challenges. And what is notable in the text, saints of God, particularly this text right here in the Psalms that we began uh, reading, we notice that we are not offered a solution to the problems and the trials that we experience. Amen. But we are given a revelation of the place of trouble and of the place of travail in the plan of God for the people of God who walk in faith. Say amen, somebody. You made it through the snow, huh, Lucy? <laughs> Praise God. You know, we see the people walking here now. They're the ones that came in through great tribulation. You know how the book of Revelation said, these are they that came through great tribulation. When the folks walking in now, they came through great tribulation to get here. Amen. Through that snowstorm outside. And so, but once again, we're given a revelation of the place of trouble and travail in the plan of God. And, and there is throughout the text that we read, amen, even though there is, uh, there are those that are undergoing trouble and calamity and challenges there's an atmosphere a spirit of expectation there is a spirit of hope prevalent despite what they are going through amen there is a dream of deliverance amen that is prevalent even in the midst of their disillusionment. There's a vision of victory, saints of God, that, that transcends the troubles and the problems of their present and looks to God for a pathway to victory. Anybody know about that? Looks to God for a turnaround, looks to God for a breakthrough, no matter how bad things may be at the moment. Is there anybody here that can relate to that mindset, amen? Now, at first, the writer of the psalm complains. And he complains that he cannot discern the activity of God, much less the presence of God during his time of distress. Amen. And he felt very lonely and he felt very isolated at this time. Because how many of you know outer trouble oftentimes is accompanied by inner turmoil? that the things you go through externally affect you internally, amen. And, and, and the inner turmoil will cause you to distance yourself from other people, amen, because you're, 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 you're trying to deal with yourself and you've got so much trying to deal with yourself that you really don't have time to try to deal with anybody else. Amen. Especially when you're one of the ones who everybody else brings their problems to. Amen. Everybody else looks for your shoulder to cry upon. Everyone else looks to pour out their complaint to you. But you've got so much that you're dealing with that you really don't have time for anybody else. Amen. It causes you to detach from others because once again, you're trying to deal with you with yourself but you're trying to deal with yourself by yourself which causes you to become somewhat withdrawn am I talking to anybody does anybody uh, because you're trying to get yourself together so that you can interact socially normally you're trying to get yourself together so that you can talk and so that you can laugh and so that you can socialize normally without your problems overwhelming you and dominating your conduct and your conversation. Uh, talk back to me if I'm talking better than you. Amen. Uh, you don't want what you're going through to be the topic of the conversation every time you open your mouth. So you, you isolate somewhat. You withdraw so that you can deal with it. Uh, and it's during this time when you relegate other other people to the position of outsiders looking in is during that time that you look inside and you look for God who is supposed to be inside of you with you 
Help me, Holy Ghost. You look for God in all of the places that God is supposed to be, but you can't seem to locate him anywhere. Amen. You sought after God in prayer. You pursued after God in praise. You hungered after God in worship. You looked for God in church. Maybe if I pray, I'll hear from God. And you start praying and you don't hear anything. Amen. You say, well, maybe, maybe if they told me if I praise him, he dwells in the midst of my praise. So I'm going to start praising him. And you praise him and he doesn't show up. And so you hunt after him in worship. They did worship the Lord and must worship him in spirit and in truth so I start worshiping God but I still can't tap in I come to church and it seems like everybody else is hearing from God except for me Am I talking to anybody? He seems nowhere to be found. And so it causes you to arrive at a wilderness season in your life. Once again, the wilderness season. Everybody say season. How many of you are glad that the wilderness is only for a season? Amen. And that seasons change. Come on back. I'm so glad about that. You arrive at a desert time in your life. A dry time. And during this time, you're very uncertain and you're very apprehensive about where your situation may inevitably lead to. I'm believing God. But if things keep going the way that they're going, there's going to be a problem. If things keep going the way that they're going, there's going to be some issues. And then on top of that, uh, your enemies. <laughs> oh, the psalmist talked about his enemies reproaching him, your enemies. <laughs> but in a lot of cases, you know, and, and even with me, I don't have a lot of enemies or I don't have a lot of people that I look at and say, no, that's my enemy right there. But I got a whole lot of frenemies. Talk back to me if I'm talking to you. Uh, your frenemies, amen. Well, some of us don't have obvious enemies, but we have a whole lot of subtle frenemies. The ones that smile at you and act like your friends, but really be hating on you behind your back, and hoping that you fail, or hoping that something bad happens to you. That they're comparing where they live with where you live, and comparing what they drive with what you drive, and comparing how much they make with what you make, and comparing their children to your children, and comparing their success to your success and they secretly are envious of you and they don't want you to succeed but the thing is you know that they're like that so you smile back anyway you, you talk back anyway you engage with you say what's up anyway but you know they're, they're, they're somewhat envious of you they're somewhat jealous of you amen and sometimes they'll even tell you well you know I was jealous of you well gee thanks for telling me but you ain't telling me nothing I didn't already know. And your frenemies, they, they, they aggravate you. How many of you have some frenemies that aggravate you at work? Uh, you on your lunch break, here they come. Yeah, oh, here they come. Here comes so-and-so. And, and, and here's the thing. If I was not a Christian, I would deal with them differently. Uh, Y'all don't want to help me, amen. I got some frenemies like that, some colleagues, some pastors, and, 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 and I've said some things to some of them that y'all don't want to know. You know, I go to God about it and repent later. I've threatened my share of them. <laughs> Thank you, John. What you say? It's all right. It's all right. God, give me some, John. Give me some. Co-sign my mess. <laughs> Be my neighbor right now. How many of y'all sometimes need somebody to co-sign your mess? You wrong. You know you wrong. They know you wrong too, but they like, go ahead. Get there. Get there. Go ahead. I got you. Your frenemies, they'll aggravate you. They'll annoy you. They'll irritate you, trying to discredit you. And, you, and really, you don't really have a problem. Pro you, you know what you have the problem of them jeffing up to you when they see you. But you know that they're bad rapping you behind your back. That's the problem right there. <laughs> Trying to discredit you and run you down and make your life unhappy, amen. And, 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 uh, come on, talk about it. Those are the ones that you really don't want to know about your issue. 
You really don't want them to know when you're going through. That's why the psalmist said, don't allow my enemies to reproach me. I don't want my enemies. When, when, when Saul died and King David uh, uh, lamented over him, he said, the beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. Amen. Uh, but then he said, publish it not in Gath. That the, the, you know, Goliath was from Gath. Publish it not in Gath that the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. In other words, uh, don't let the Philistines know what happened to Saul because Saul is still one of us. I don't want them laughing and rejoicing over the way he went out. There are just some people you don't want to know that you're going through. Uh, you just want to, everybody else can know but them. Amen. That's where the psalmist was. And then you find yourself, when you're alone like this, you find yourself, amen, when you're in your periods of insulation and isolation, crying more than you're laughing. Amen. You find yourself worrying more than you are cheerful. You're emotionally exhausted and, and mentally drained and spiritually weak but then the psalmist after presenting that scenario he he he, he offers a ray of hope I mean he displayed an attitude of expectation by reminding us uh, that there is a set time help me Holy Ghost there is an appointed time there is a designated time for deliverance by God what did I say I love about seasons and that's the fact that seasons change, amen. If you come along into my life at the wrong season, you'll think that I'm all messed up. If you come along in my life in the wintertime season and you see the trees barren and you see the grass brown, and you come over my house and you see that things are looking bleak, and you think it is bad, you think it's not beautiful, but if you come back in the right season, if you come back in the spring when things are starting to come up, if you come back in the summer when the flowers are beautiful and the trees are full. You know the thing about seasons is the fact that seasons change. Bad becomes good. Uh, the decrease becomes increased. Talk back to me. He said, there's a designated time for deliverance by God. He said, God shall arise. God shall emerge. God shall come forth and have mercy upon Zion, the people of God. And the primary revelation that is presented by the psalmist, saints, is that in our day of trouble and in our day of distress and in our time of trial and in our, our, our periods, amen, of problems, that God does not abandon us. That God is aware of our issues and God will deliver us at his designated set time and this confidence in God increased his consciousness of God. Can I make it plainer? God does not abandon his people when things get difficult and times get hard. God does not desert us when circumstances become challenging or when our situations become unstable. How many of you know God is near to us when he seems to be far from us? God is present with us when God seems to be absent from us. God is watching when God seems to be blind to our struggle. God is aware of what we we're going to uh, when we wonder if he's unaware of what we're going through. Uh, and you also need to know, saints of God, that deliverance, help me Holy Ghost, uh, our deliverance is always interconnected uh, with the affliction that we are experiencing in the plan of God. Uh, and that actually our deliverance is the reason for our affliction. You have to understand the Bible says God does not afflict us willingly. And help me, Holy Ghost. Wherever and whenever affliction, problems, trials, tribulations, turmoil, circumstances, and situations do come, God's purpose is to deliver us out of it. But watch this. God's purpose is not exclusively to deliver us from the affliction itself. But his purpose is to deliver us from whatever the reason for the affliction is. So God 
allows the affliction in order to correct some underlying imperfections that are resident on the inside of us. Amen. He allows affliction in order to address some of our character deficiencies. And in order to improve some flaws and shortcomings in our spiritual development. So in actuality, y'all are going to have to help me right here. In actuality, your deliverance is the reason for your affliction. God allows you to be afflicted in order to manifest your deliverance. I have to make it plain. I see. Too often we cry out to God to be delivered from the suffering. We cry out to God to be delivered from the hurt. Cry out to God to be delivered from the pain from the problem that accompany our affliction rather than to be delivered from the reason for the affliction I'll make it plainer we too often desire to be delivered from the pain that our issue causes rather than to be delivered from the issue that caused the pain you want to be delivered from the pain that that person is causing you rather than to be delivered from the person that is causing the pain you want to cry out, Lord, make him stop hurting me, rather than cry out, Lord, get this person out of my life. We want to be delivered from the pain the person causes, rather than to be delivered from the person that causes the pain. See, it's important for you to understand that God is allowing you to be afflicted. God is allowing you to go through. I hope I'm helping somebody. In order to deliver you from some things internally that affect you externally in so much so that if someone asks you why you're going through, uh, you can tell them the reason I'm going through is because God is not finished working on me yet. Uh, I'm going through because God is in the construction or reconstruction process. Tell them if you think, hey amen, uh, you, 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 you owe them an explanation. If you, you know, folk always want to know why. They just tell them, they say, God is up to something big in my life. God is actually preparing me to be blessed. Are you with me? The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119 and 67, he said, before I was afflicted, this is in the scripture, he said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Help me, Holy Ghost. Anybody know about that right there? The psalmist said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I observed thy word. Help me, Holy Ghost. Then he said in verse 71 of Psalm 119, he said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. Amen. Help me, Holy Ghost. See, there's a purpose behind, behind our affliction, and the purpose makes the affliction more bearable. In Psalm 119, verse 75, he says, I know, O Lord, that your judgment are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. How many of you are here today that can add your testimony to those words? How many of you today, if you're really going to be honest, you can look back over your life and say that it was good that I was afflicted in the way that I was afflicted. It was good that I went to what I went to that I thought was bad. It was good that that person walked out of my life and broke my heart. It was good that I lost that house. It was good that I broke up with this person. It was good that I didn't get that job. It was good that I was laid off. It was good that I spent some time in the penitentiary. See, once you've been delivered from your affliction, you can look back and see how valuable your affliction actually was. Oh, somebody in your say to yourself, it was good for me that I went through that. It was good for me that I was afflicted. It was good for me. I learned some things out of that that I couldn't have learned any other way. It caused me to become a different person. It caused me to walk a different way. It caused me to have a different level of understanding about the ins and outs of life. I mean, God allowed you to be afflicted. Uh, not so much that he could bring you out of some stuff. God allowed you to be afflicted so that he could pull some stuff out of you. Shout about it. 
He wants to bring you out of your issues and bring you out of your drama so that he can bring your issues and bring drama out of you. Isaiah said when Zion travailed, when Zion was afflicted, when Zion went through a struggle, Zion brought forth that as soon as Zion travailed, Zion gave birth. And God told me to tell somebody this morning that after you've been through some stuff, after this trouble is over, after this problem is solved, after this struggle, amen, passes, you're going to give birth to some stuff that God placed on the inside that you've been carrying for a long time. You're going to conceive some things that will result in a harvest in your life. After you've been through some stuff, somebody shout glory. After you've been through some stuff, what God conceived in you is going to be birthed out of you, out of your pain, out of your struggle, out of your turmoil, out of your adversity. God said in Isaiah 66, he says, shall I bring the birth and not cause it to bring forth? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut up the womb? And God told me to tell somebody, whether you're in person or watching online, he told me to tell you by way of the Holy Ghost that he would not put something in you and then not allow you to bring it out. Help me, Holy Ghost. He's not going to put a dream in you. He's not going to put a plan in you. He's not going to put a vision in you. He's He's not going to put something in you. He's not going to put destiny in you and then prevent that thing from coming forth. But it can't come out until you've been through some travail. It can't come out until you've been through some stuff. It can't come out until the affliction is over. It can't come out until your deliverance is done. Shout about it right there. And it won't come out of you until you come out of your trouble. Talk to me, somebody. Your purpose, your destiny will only come out of you when you come out of your affliction. That's why the apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in you. He said the suffering of this present time, the problems of this present time, the issues of this present time, the drama of this present time, the challenges of this present time. Is there anybody here that's experiencing some present time suffering? You're suffering financially at this present time. You got some emotional drama at this present time. You're physically suffering. You're suffering relationally at this present time. But you've got to understand that your present time suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. Which means that what you're going through is not worthy to be compared to what you're going to. Talk back to me. What you're going through is not worthy to be compared to what God is going to bring up and out of you. Shout about it. Look at somebody next to you and touch them and tell them, I need y'all to help me preach this morning. Those of you that are watching online, say the same thing. Look at somebody and say, your blessing is coming out of your affliction. Your blessing is coming out of your pain. Your blessing is coming out of your struggle. Out of your glory is coming out of your hurt, out of your trouble, out of your drama, out of your trial. The Bible says this light affliction, which is but for a moment, look at somebody and tell them what you're going through is a light thing to God. Your light affliction is which is but for a moment. Look at somebody else and tell them whatever you're going through, it'll be over soon. It will be over soon. What you're going through, your light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Oh, talk to somebody and tell them. 
say your affliction, uh, baby, is working for you. Your trouble uh, is working for you. It's contributing uh, to your blessing. That's why the Bible says uh, all things uh, work together uh, for the good uh, of you uh, if you love God, uh, which means all the elements uh, and all the incidents uh, of your life, uh, all the ingredients uh, of your life uh, that might be bad uh, in and of themselves uh, are all working together uh, for your good. Uh, all of your hurt, uh, all of your pain, uh, all of your disappointment, uh, all of your problem, uh, things that were bad uh, all by themselves, uh, God is working them uh, all together for your good. The heartache and the heartbreak, the failure and the mistake, the disappointment and the betrayal, the rejection and the shame. Look at somebody and tell them it's all working together. It's working far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Look at somebody and tell them, I know you've been through a lot and I know it's been rough, but baby, it's all for the glory. Look at somebody and say, it's all for the glory. It's all for the glory. All of the problems, all of the issues, all of the hurt, all of the stress, all of the strain, all of the irritation, all of the aggravation, it's all for the glory. It's working together for your good contributing to your blessing. The Bible says, while I look not at the things which are seen. You know what this means? We don't focus on our problems. We keep our focus on our promise. Look at somebody say, I can't focus on my problems. I got to focus on my promise. He promised to bless me um, and my house. He promised to deliver me from all of my affliction. He promised to heal my body of all of my disease. He promised to pour me out a blessing. I don't have room enough to receive. So I don't look. I don't fixate on my problems. I don't focus on my problems problems because they're only temporary. Somebody say they're temporary. Look at somebody say you ain't broke. You're just having a cash flow disruption right now. But it's only temporary. Your problems are temporary. But my promise is sure. My promise is steadfast. My promise is guaranteed. If you believe it, clap your hands and give him praise. Can I come around the corner? The set time, the designated time for your deliverance arrives. It says, God will arise and have mercy upon Zion. So your set time arrives when God arises. Watch this, I'll make it plainer. God is omniscient, which means he has all knowledge. God has all knowledge of things past, present, and future. God knows the reason for your trouble. He watches the process in your trouble. He proceeds towards the end of your trouble. So that means that God's activity in your life today is not only for today, but it's for yesterday and tomorrow as well. So what happens is he will bring closure and give new meaning or significance to your past while at the same time he will establish you for your future by the way he delivers you in this present time. When God brought Joseph out, he brought closure to his past. Because he told his brothers, now I know. <laughs> See, when God brought him out, it gave new significance to what he had been through. He said, now I know. It wasn't y'all that threw me in that pit. Now I know. It wasn't y'all that sold me into slavery. Now I know. You're not the reason I went through. Now I know that it was God all the time. So when God brought him out in this present, he brought closure to his past, gave his past new meaning, but he also established his future by placing him on that throne. God will arise. God will move at the right moment in your life. 
to everything Solomon said. There is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. There's a time God has designated. He will arise and move at the right time in your life at the set time that has been designated for your deliverance. When your problems have served their purpose, God will deliver you. But see, here's the revelation that expedites the process. Here comes some more that made it through great tribulation. Weaving and cutting. Weaving and cutting. <laughs> <laughs> what Mr. Isham say, Terry, weaving and cutting. Amen. Here's a revelation <laughs> that expedites the process. Your attitude is the key to God's arising and God's arrival. Your attitude dictates and determines the set time of your designated deliverance. I'll make it plain. <laughs> the writer wrote, we read, and he said, your servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust. In other words, when the people of God look at their troubles because of the affliction in their life, that have been allowed by God, yet they still take pleasure in God, even while we're in our problems, that we enjoy our relationship with God in spite of the circumstances, situations we find ourselves in. When the people of God are going through hell, but praise God anyway. Anybody know about that? When the people of God are going through hell, but praise God anyway, God will get up. God will take notice. God will arise when you magnify him in spite of. When you glorify him in spite of. When you lift him up in spite of pain, in spite of tragedy, in spite of trouble, in spite of calamity, in spite of sickness. That's when God arises. That's when God stands up. And when God stands up, God will show up. Shout about it right there. Somebody lift him up. If you start lifting him up right now if you start praising him right now so that he will stand up because when God shows up God will show out on your behalf shout glory I'm trying to come home I'm trying to come home y'all come on with me y'all come on with me y'all y'all help me get home can y'all can y'all push me home can y'all can y'all help me? Can y'all enable me to get off? We looked over in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was mystified. He was stupefied by the persecution that he and his people were experiencing. Confused. I don't understand. He asked the question. In the book that bears his name, he said, what is God doing? Anybody ever asked that question? See, let's ignore the inaccuracies of the word of faith movement for a moment. And understand that it's not wrong sometimes to question God. Because I've said it before, 66 books in the Bible, 65 of those books are God talking to man. But the book of Psalms is man talking to God. And all you see in the book of Psalms is folks questioning God. What the heck is going on? Lord, why am I going through this? Lord, why are you letting my enemies triumph over me? Lord, why am I all strung out like this? Lord, why don't I have provision? Lord, why don't I have protection? Lord, get my enemies, Lord. Get revenge for me. Lord, they're doing me wrong. You see them. I, I need you to get them for me, God. I need you to handle some stuff. And nowhere do I see God rebuking them for saying this. The only one that ever got checked somewhat was Job. 
And he didn't even really get checked like that. It's just he got to talking to God, said, hey, hey, boy, calm down. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And the sons of God shouted for joy at the creation. It's like you talking to your kids, you little whippersnapper. You don't, you, I, I'm going to leave that there. But he was mystified. He said, what is God doing? Anybody ever asked that question? Yeah. You know, we, we tell you God is doing something in your life. Oh, God doing it. I, I, how many of y'all have heard about the new thing 30 years ago? You know what? A new thing ain't always a good thing. God is doing a new thing, then you lose the house. Oh, he did a new thing? All right. God is doing a new thing. You jumped around, went to work the next day, and got laid off. Oh, wait a minute, God. New thing don't always mean good thing at that moment. But if I can tell, what is God doing? He said, I cry. And notice something here. Watch this. He wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost saw fit to include it in the canon of Scripture. What is God doing? I cry out to him. But he doesn't deliver. Anybody ever, anybody ever, anybody ever ask that question? What is God doing? Lord, why aren't you helping me? Where are you at? During my time of need, he complained because of the affliction of his people, and God seemed to make no response. He said, Lord, how long will I cry, and you will not hear? I'm crying out in desperation, and you still have not delivered me. But then God declared, God spoke to him and said, I will work a work in your day, which you will not believe, even if I tell you. And God told me to tell somebody this morning that he's about to do some unbelievable stuff in your life. If you believe it, shout hallelujah. Habakkuk said, I'm going to stand on my watch and set me upon a tower and wait to see what God is going to tell me. And the result of his waiting was a song of praise. Then he went on to say later on in the chapter, he said, though the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, even if the labor of the olives fail and the fields don't yield any harvest, if there are no herds in my stall, he said, even if I'm in a time of barrenness, even if I'm in a season of insufficiency, even if this, my life is not going the way I wanted to go right now, he say yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation how many of you know that Habakkuk's knowledge of God produced his confidence in God and the words he used are of very special significance because when he said I will rejoice in the Lord the literal Hebrew translation is I will jump for joy in the Lord and when he said I will joy in the God of my salvation the literal Hebrew says, I will spin around in the God of my salvation. He said, I'm going through some dry times, some difficult times, some rough times in my life. My enemies are afflicting me. My problems are overwhelming me. I'm in a season in my life when nothing is producing, nothing is coming up. There's trouble all around me, on my right and my left. Problems all around me, in front and behind. There's nothing to indicate that I'll ever be delivered. Nothing that indicates I'll ever come out. Nothing to indicate things are going to change. There's no blossom on the fruit tree. There's no fruit on the vine. The oil isn't coming out of the olives. The herds are not producing in the stall. My life is a mess right now. Everything is in turmoil. My back against the wall but I'm a jump for joy in my God I'm a spin around with gladness in my God are there any crazy people under the sound of my 
voice. You're going through a dry season. You're going through affliction. You're going through adversity. You're in a time of stress. You're in a time of struggle. But in spite of your affliction, in spite of your problems, you'll say like the psalmist, I will jump for joy in the Lord. I'll spin around with gladness in my God. Because when I do, I'm making God get up. When I do, I'm bringing forth my set time. When I do, my deliverance gets started. Is there anybody here that doesn't mind praising God in spite of what's going on in your life? I need some people that don't mind praising, that don't mind jumping, that don't mind spinning in order to get your breakthrough. You're going through hell right now. Don't have any money. Children acting crazy. Doctor gave a bad report. Marriage is in a mess. Homes all tore up. Bills are all behind. But you still say, I will jump for joy in my God. I will spin around in my God because my praise puts my deliverance into process. I need some people that don't mind lifting them up. I need some people that don't mind giving God praise and open up your mouth and decree and declare by faith my set time, my set time, my set time is coming. Look at somebody and say, my set time, my praise releases my set time. Set time for my favor. Set time for my deliverance. Set time for my breakthrough. Set time for my manifestation. Shout glory. Is there anybody here that doesn't mind giving God praise? Anybody here that will decree by faith my set time, my set time for my blessing, for my promotion, for my increase, for my turnaround, for my new house, for my new car, for me to get married, for my vision to come forth, for my business to prosper, for my dream to come true. Is there anybody here that would give God a praise and say, my set time is now. Now is the time. Today is the day that God is going to move on my behalf. And I receive it right now. And I give him praise. Look at somebody and tell them, say, I'm rejoicing because I can see my deliverance. I see it by faith. I see my victory. I see my breakthrough. I see my turnaround. I see it by faith. The leaves might be barren, but the fruit is gonna be in abundance. The seed might be bad, but my harvest is gonna be good. My suffering might feel bad, but the glory that I go to is gonna feel good. God told Habakkuk to calm down. And I'm telling you right now, each and every person under the sound of my voice, calm down. Stop stressing. Stop worrying. It's gonna be all right. Because you know what he said? You know what he told Habakkuk? He said, I'm doing a secret work in your life. God said, right now, I'm engaged in an undercover operation. Notice what he said. He said, because if I told you about it, if I showed it to you in advance, you wouldn't believe it. And God told me to tell some of you this morning to get ready for an unbelievable blessing, an unbelievable breakthrough. God told me to tell you, he's about to do some unbelievable things in your life. He's going to give you some unbelievable stuff. Look at somebody and say, get ready, get ready, get prepared. Start praising. Because God is going to release an unbelievable increase, an unbelievable healing, an unbelievable deliverance, 
in your life. He told Habakkuk, if I told you what I was up to, you wouldn't believe it. It's unbelievable. God said, if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't have faith for it. If I told you in advance what I was doing, you would exercise doubt. So God said, I'm going to do it on my own. He said, it might seem like I'm allowing you to go through for no reason. Seems like you're being afflicted for no cause. But my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are greater than your ways. And so you know what this means? What God is doing is beyond the scope of your comprehensive abilities. I'll make it plainer. How can prison lead to a palace? How can trouble take me to a throne? How can a seaway become a highway? You walked us out of there into this? Right up to the sea? Watch this. How can a walk around cause walls to fall down? God said, if I told you in advance, you wouldn't believe it. I'm going to have y'all march around seven times, then you're going to shout, and then the wall's going to fall down. Man, don't nobody believe that. Sound like something crazy. Some prophet come up in church and say, God said you're going to come out of uh, Egypt after being slaves. He's going to set you free, and you're going to walk, and you're going to walk up to the river, and then you're going to walk up into the, uh, to the sea, and he's going to make the sea open up, and you're going to walk right through it. <laughs> you believe that? Come on now. Your brothers threw you in the pit, and then you got sold into slavery, and then you got accused of rape, and then you got put in a dungeon, but then he did all that because he's going to make you the prime minister of all of Egypt. Man, come on, stop. Stop. Another one of them old whack prophecies. You're hiding in caves, and you're hiding in the wilderness, and you're hiding in the woods, and then you got to act like you're crazy, and you got to start foaming at the mouth and go hide over there with the enemies because the Israelites are all trying to kill you, but you're going to wind up being the king over all of the people just trying to kill you. Man, nah, done it. I ain't got time to be trying to even believe all that. I'm just trying to stay alive right now. All that stuff you're telling me, all them good prophecies, you, all that good words you're giving me, it's good right over there, but right now I got to deal with this. God said, I'm doing some unbelievable things in your life. And if I told you in advance, if I showed you in advance what I was doing, you start asking too many doubt-filled questions. Well, how then? Well, what? Well, what you're telling me is I'm supposed to, mm-hmm, and then after that, then what? And okay, so who's going to do it now? No, y'all start asking a whole bunch of questions. Doubt-filled questions. He said, your job is to just trust me and praise me and worship me and stay faithful to me and let me handle the rest. Because I'm telling you by way of the Holy Ghost, no matter what you're going through right now, whoever you are under the sound of my voice, it's all going to work together for your good. Now stand up on your feet, clap your hands, open up your mouth, send some praise up so God can stand up, so that when God stands up, God will show up, because when God shows up, God's going to show out in your life. Open up your mouth and give him praise right now. Keep those hands up. Father, in the outstanding, tremendous, spectacular, amazing, marvelous name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve. We thank you once again for the light, the illumination, the revelation, the edification, the exhortation, and the comfort that accompanies the reception the, of your word. I pray for each and every one of these blessed saints. I pray for Zion, even now, on the sound of my voice, that you arise in their life and arrive in their situation, in their circumstance, at the time that you have set, that you have designated for their deliverance to manifest. I pray that you bless them exceeding and abundantly above all that they can ask or think. That you bless them with the desires of their heart as a result 
as a consequence of the delight that they have in you. Bring them out of their issue, out of their struggle, out of their pain, out of their problems with a strong and mighty hand. I pray, oh Lord, for emotional deliverance, for mental deliverance, from relational deliverance, from fi for financial deliverance, relief from the struggle, relief from the bills, relief from the worry and the stress that accompany day-to-day -day living. Stabilize our homes, stabilize our households, allow us to walk in the abundance of the life that you have promised us that you have come to give. And we give you glory, honor, and praise in spite of everything that the enemy is endeavoring to use against us because we have faith that the good work you've begun in us, you'll be faithful to perform. Now move swiftly and expeditiously on our behalf. And we give you glory in advance for everything we're expecting you to do in our life in this year. Cause our manifestation to occur speedily. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. amen. Say amen one more time. Give him one more good, 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 good praise. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're going to, we're going to complete our worship experience through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to pay our tithe. We're going to give the Lord our very best offering. Because in the eyes of God, it's all one experience. You can't have the word without worship. You can't have the worship unless you first praised. You can't praise until there's been an invocation. Then after the word, there has to be a, a rendering of, 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 of tribute and tithe and offerings. And then the benediction, to seal the word with the benediction and to bless you as you go out from this place. But in the eyes of God, it was, it's one experience. Under the old economy and even in the New Testament, when they were coming to the temple, their worship consisted, when they were coming to the synagogue as well, that Jesus attended, their worship experience consisted of this, the praising of God, the singing of psalms, the worship, receiving the word, and an offering, and a benediction. But there weren't different activities. They were all components of one activity. In other words, you couldn't have the one activity if any of those components were missing. It all is looked at as a, as a whole. And so our offering, our tithe, is just as much a part of worship as our praise. It's just as much a part of our experience with God as any other facet. The word going forth, whatever, it's all one activity. They would, they would come, they would bring their sacrifice, they would bring their offering, and oftentimes, to be quite honest, we're doing it a little bit in reverse because they would bring the offering, amen, in the old economy. They would bring the bull or the goat or the turtle dove or whatever. They would put it on the altar, sacrifice it to God, and then they would make a petition. Then they would ask his favor. But they would not make any requests unless they first offered something because it establishes a medium of exchange between the offerer the worshiper, and God. Amen? So we're going to bless him right now through the giving of our material gifts. Come on, pay your tithe today. It's a new year, new dedication, new commitment. Don't, don't start off this year doing the same old slack stuff you did last year. If you went out of 22 not being a tither, don't go into 23 be not being a tither. Tell yourself, you know what? God's going to write all that off. Whatever I didn't do, that's in the past. But I'm going to tell you what I can do from right here on. I'm going to pay my tithe. I'm going to get, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to prove. He said, prove me now herewith. Let me tell you, God will put your life on a course that you never expected if you just give him faith and faithfulness and commitment. Amen. He will bless you. I'm, I'm watching people. People are dying out here right now. They don't even know why. Folks are just, they're dropping dead. They have this, this virus out, this RVS, uh, 
RSV or whatever, and I was talking to my sister about it the other day because we were talking about somebody that had a heart attack, and what she said was how that it puts so much pressure that it overworks your heart. I mean, my wife, after she ministered a couple of weeks ago, she left out and went in the back and, and couldn't breathe. She couldn't get her, she couldn't breathe at all. Uh, Candy was there and Tammy and others, and I came back, and she couldn't breathe at all. And then it came back. You know, she got her breath back and had just take a moment. And um, I know, Jason, you were going through, you had had a lot of folks are going to emergency and different things like that. And to be quite honest, and I'm not going to get into this, but I know one thing, the media is downplaying it for political purposes. And we just leave that right there. Because I tell you what, a couple of years ago, if everybody was dropping dead, they, they, they'd had that stuff on. You have a death count on TV because they would be able to look at a person or people in authority and blame it on them. But right now, the media is kind of low, low rating this stuff. Man, folk out here, the football player, they give him a little hit. It wasn't that bad. This guy just dropped out and had a heart attack. They, they got a video out of people just walking and just falling down. Kids dying on basketball courts and dying on soccer fields. And I mean, it felt folks are just, you know, and, and it ain't just about a conspiracy. It's vaccinated and unvaccinated. It, it don't matter. We ain't going to get into that stuff. I'm just saying. A thousand to fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near us if we walk in faith and believe God. I got to stay in fellowship with God. I can't let something small not like me not tithing get me out from under the shadow of the Almighty in the secret place of the Most High. I ain't going to let that stuff, I'm not going to let something that I can control get me out of the will of God. Man, they dying out here in these streets. It's, 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 it's dangerous outside of the will of God right now. So what you're saying, saints, is that some pastors that none of the saints are, are dying? Yeah, but the thing about the saints is if the saints do die, we know where they're going to heaven. <laughs> but I believe in God for protection, for preservation. I want to make sure that I make my calling and election sure that I'm going to have the answer, the Bible says, of a clear conscience before God. And I'm not going to sit there and hear the pastor saying it's time for us to pay our tithe. And I'm sitting there knowing I ain't paying nothing. I ain't doing it. Mm -mm. I don't care. I don't care what he say. I'll never forget a young lady went here a long time ago when we first started. I don't even think we were in the sanctuary. And she had a good job. And she was like, she tell us point blank our faith. I ain't paying. No, I ain't paying no tithe. I ain't paying nothing. And we're like, well, I ain't going to kick you out for that. It's between you and God. Then one day we'll be back there, and she's like, I got a word. I got a word. We used to have prayer meeting back there in the room back there, and, and she had a word. <laughs> I got a word. The Lord gave me a word. I said, no, the Lord ain't gave you no word. Yes, he did. I said, if the Lord gave you a word, he'd tell you pay your time. <laughs> Until you get that word, you can't give no word. Dan, you remember? End of the year, we give out the tithe statements. I said, you ain't got to go look in the computer for hers. I'll write it out. I took a piece of paper. I wrote $52. Because she came to church every week. She only put a dollar in. Then she passed. She wound up leaving. She was gone for years. Then she passed. And you know what happens? What so, happens so many times? Once she passed, here come a family member. She's a member of the church. She was? I ain't seen her in years. I don't know where she was at. I don't know what she was doing. Well, we want to know if we can, because she didn't have can y'all. Y'all can judge me all you want to, but I, I, I can't help you. Where the tree falls, that's where it lay. You have a church. We can marry you. We can bury you. <laughs> And we, we live in and among one each other as a community. And we all, I mean, even when you live in a city, that's why they have everybody pay their taxes because we all have to contribute to the community. And that's what the purpose of tithing often is, to con contribute to the community of the people of God in the worship and praise of the Lord. Amen. And like I said, I just don't want to be caught out here. Like we used to say when I was on the streets, I don't want to be caught out here when my pants die. I ain't going to be out of here. I got to stand before God 
answer to why I didn't want to pay my tithe. That ain't going to happen. Say amen. So we want to bless him. I want those of you that will, we have an over and above seed that we've been, amen, requesting. And we feel that God has laid it upon our heart to request it. Those of you that are watching online, go to givelify.com. Text to give, PayPal, Tithely. Whatever platform you utilize to bless the kingdom of God. I want those of you that will to sow that over and above $23 seed on this morning. $23 seed. The year 2023. Two is the number of unity. Excuse me. Two is the number of union. One is the number of unity. Two is the number of union. And three is the number of divinity. Three is the number of God. The number 23 represents union with God. It represents the purpose, the presence of God in your life. It represents walking with God and talking with God and living for God, union with God. I want those of you that will to take an extra envelope and sow that $23 over and above seed. Amen. And when you're ready to give, I want you to, those of you that are watching online, I want you to sow that seed as well. Amen. And when you're ready to give, please stand to your feet. I pray I blessed you on this morning with that word. Amen. I thank you for allowing me to speak into your life. I don't take that privilege for granted. And I try not to give you any nonsense or okie doke a riffraff. I'm glad that over these years, I really haven't had to get up and apologize about anything I preached in the past and told you what I was wrong back then. And I'm, I'm, I haven't had to unpreach anything I preached. I try to stay away from the fads and, and the latest thing and, 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 and because, you know, that stuff wears out over time. But the word of God is a sure word. It's true, amen. Everyone's standing, everyone walking so nobody has to squeeze past you. Ushers, come on, leave from the rear. Listen, after you pay your tithe, just return or stay. Then we're going to pray the benediction, and then we'll all be dismissed together. Amen. You don't know that, that benediction. I'll cover you. That benediction to get you home in this snowstorm, that benediction, it seals the word that you received. Amen. Set time. another hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. How many was blessed by that dynamite word from our pastor this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. This is our set time. Amen. Because we are living in the year of transparency. Amen. And expectancy 
We expect to be blessed every day of this year. Amen. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Point your hands towards your offering this morning, saints. Father God, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity that you have allowed us, your sons and daughters, to give back to you a portion of that that you have so richly and abundantly blessed us with. Now, gracious Father, we pray that you might take these tithes and this offering and multiply it for your praise, for your honor, and for your glory. And bless those that gave, bless those that had a desire to give that but did not have it. Bless them so that they can give the next time. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. Before we dismiss the service this afternoon, there might be someone in the congregation whose life seems to be going around like they are in a revolving elevator or a revolving door. And you are not acquainted or you haven't accepted the person that our pastor talk about and, and, and believe the merits that Jesus Christ done for his sons and daughters. This is your set time for salvation today. Yes. This is your set time for salvation today. If you believe the word that was preached to you or is being taught to you on a weekly basis and you come down the aisles confessing and believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the word says that thou shall be saved. Amen. But you have to believe it. The key is you have to believe it. Watch this. When Paul made his appeal to go to Rome and stand before Caesar, and they was uh, going to take him by boat, Paul stood up uh, in front of, I think it was King Festus and King Agrippa. And when Paul pleaded his case, of why and what he was doing for the Lord. Paul laid it out unequivocally. He said, God has anointed me. God has poured his spirit out upon me. And what I'm doing, I'm really not doing it, but it's the Holy Ghost on the inside of me doing the work. And when Paul pleaded his case, King Agrippa said something very unique, and I hope you catch it. He said, Paul, sometimes too much learning is not well for a man. But King Agrippa said, thou almost, almost persuaded me to become a Christian. It's not our aim. It's not our focus today. It's not Dr. Darrell's aim, Dr. Belinda's aim today to almost persuade you to become a Christian. It's our aim to point you in the road to salvation. Amen. We don't want to be almost a Christian. Almost will not do. 99 and a half will not do. You have to be sold out totally for the kingdom of God. Yes. So I'm going to ask one more time, is there anyone in the service today that would have the boldness to walk down these aisles this morning and accept our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as your Lord today? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Is there anyone in the house today? Well, praise God. We thank God for household salvation. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Any announcements today? Amen. God bless you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to make you aware of an event that we have for the Young Girls Girl, Girl Squad coming up um, next Saturday, uh, January 28th, from 2.15 to 4.30. We'll be bowling at Pinstripes and Beechwood. Uh, so the, co the cost is covered, so if you want your daughter uh, or niece to attend, please see me and we'll make sure that we get a spot signed up. Uh, and then we have a whole, the whole uh, year planned out so you won't know at the last minute. So I'll, uh, please make sure you see, excuse me, you see me if I don't have you on the parents' uh, text group list. Sorry about that if you don't like group text, but it's a way for me to keep everybody posted. Uh, see me and make sure I get your number and we'll, you'll be aware of everything we have going on. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. It's one thing I can say for Sister Trina and those that work with her. They have a heart for the young people. Amen. They have a heart for the young people. They are genuinely concerned about them and they want to keep them on that road to glory and salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. If all minds are at ease this morning, gracious Father, we just thank you for all that you have done this day. We thank you for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard today. Now, Father God, as we prepare to leave this place, but certainly not from your presence, we pray, Father, that when we go out the doors, that you might dispatch your ministering angels to place them around our vehicles, the bus, or whatever means that we got here this morning to protect us from the elements of the snow, to protect us from accidents, to protect us from all hurt, harm, and danger and allow each and every one of us to assemble ourselves here in this great house Tuesday night at Power Prayer. We just love you, we praise you, we magnify you, and we glorify your name today. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Wasn't that a word straight from heaven? Oh my goodness. Now you take that word and take it with you all through the week to be fuel for your spirit, to strengthen you and keep you. Listen, if you haven't had a chance to give yet, the options for giving are right on the screen. The Bible says the liberal soul shall be made fat. And when your seed leaves your hand, it does not leave your life. And remember, there's a harvest attached to every single seed you sow. So let's always give always in full expectation, knowing and believing and trusting that for every seed we sow, there is a harvest on the way. Please join us for worship services this coming Sunday at 1015 a.m. in person and 11 o'clock a.m. online. And then be sure to join us on Tuesdays online or in person at 730 for prophetic power prayer. And please don't forget to join us for our midweek Bible study service at 7.30 on Thursday evenings online. At New Spirit Revival Center, you can be sure to get a few things. Sound doctrine, for sure. A word from the Lord, for sure. A sure word, a seasoned word, for sure. And a word that will change your life. Holy Spirit-filled services. Holy Ghost-led love from the uh from our members and just everything you could want in a church church the way it's supposed to be so come on and join us have a blessed week we love you see you on tuesday